The Philadelphia 76ers had the dream off season, adding veteran talent and getting an extension done with Joel Embiid. Many have this 76ers team as the second best team in the Eastern Conference. And in this video, I'll give you four reasons why this could be the case. Then we're going to use those reasons to put them face to face against the Boston Celtics to see who would win in a seven game series. That bucket. Lowry operating, this is Embiid, crowded, fires, and he buries it. The first reason why the Philadelphia 76ers could be the best team in the East next season has to do with just how good Joel Embiid was last season. Joel Embiid would have certainly won the MVP last season if he didn't get injured. In the month of December alone, Joel had a truly historic month, putting up a ridiculous 40.2 points, 12.6 rebounds, 1.4 steals and 2.1 blocks on 60-40-92 shooting splits. The shooting splits throughout the month of December for Joel Embiid were well above the 50-40-90 club, which has only ever been achieved nine times over the course of an entire season. Some of those legendary scorers that were able to achieve this mark were Steve Nash, Larry Bird, and Kevin Durant, who all did it multiple times. At all three levels, Joel Embiid is truly an elite scorer. Deep in the paint is where Embiid can dominate using his size and strength. Here, knowing exactly where the double team is coming from, as he's able to spin the other way, Way for a fadeaway over OG Ananobi. Coming downhill, Joel gets to a tough Eurostep move for two more. In this new Nick Nurse led Sixers offense, Philly now more than ever can fully clear the lane using four three point threats. With the floors spaced, it makes it much harder to double team Embiid and most importantly, much more risky as Joel's playmaking has continued to improve. The Sixers have adjusted their offensive game plan to get Embiid the easiest looks possible. As here between confusion from Paul and Gafford and a DeAnthony Melton screen, Embiid gets an easy two at the basket. Now yes, this is against the Wizards defense who weren't a good defensive team, but even against the number one rated defense in the league last season, Joel Embiid was still able to pick them apart. Here with Carl Anthony Towns guarding him tight, Joel puts his head down, getting deep into the paint for two. Now in the two-man game with Tyrese Maxey, Embiid gets open beyond the arc. Joel now attacks the closeout of Gobert, but this time he pulls up on the mid range jumper. These last two plays perfectly showcase just how difficult it is to contain Joel Embiid, and that's because of just how unpredictable he truly is. This clip against Nikola Vucevic perfectly illustrates this point, as the Chicago defense has no idea if he's going to drive or shoot, and Embiid will stand and wait for the defense to make a move, and once they do, he pounces, this time rising up for the jumper. As an opposing defense, you can't scheme against this guy, as you have to play a little off of him to not let him get to his drives, but you also have to play him close enough to be able to contest the jumper, leading to a matchup nightmare for anybody in this league, as you can't make a game plan around something as unpredictable as Joel Embiid. And this is why he's the most unguardable player in the NBA right now. And if he's able to stay healthy, he could take them very deep into the postseason. However, that's been the talking point for Joel Embiid over his entire career, as even after eight seasons in the NBA, heading into his age 30 season, Season, Embiid is still yet to make an appearance in the conference finals or even play more than 70 games throughout a season. Even though Joel Embiid was playing through knee injuries last postseason, he still managed to have his best playoffs by far, averaging 33 points per game on good efficiency, shooting 44-33-85. However, his sixes still fell in six games in a tough series against the Knicks. So this leaves two giant questions to be answered next season for Joel Embiid. First, is it possible for Embiid to enter the postseason fully healthy and stay that way. And secondly, if he does, will it be good enough to beat the Boston Celtics? These next three reasons will help to uncover the potential answers. George. Three to shoot. Gets down. Let's it fly for the lead. Hot damn! He's got 28 for the Cavaliers. He gets downhill. He gets to the rim. Blocked by George! The second reason why the Sixers could be the best team in the Eastern Conference next season is because of what Paul George could bring to this team. After not coming to an agreement with the Clippers, PG headed east and decided to join the 76ers, who after parting ways with James Harden, had plenty of salary to sign him and still get quality role players, which we'll take a deeper look at later in this video. Paul George is a huge upgrade over Tobias Harris at the three or the four, as George is not only a better scorer at all three levels, 
but he's also a much better defensive player than Harris. This two-way ability will be huge for the Sixers next season. Paul George is able to score within the flow of a team's offense, off cuts, and catch-and-shoot looks, but his most valuable asset on offense is his isolation scoring. Here, Kawhi will allow PG to switch on the bigger Markkanen, and by using a behind-the-back dribble and a step back, PG knocks down the long two. Here, Kawhi's forced to pick up his dribble in the paint and has to get it out to PG, who's first able to attack the closeout of Horton Tucker and then finish over the contest of Walker Kessler. Here, PG makes the read that Dunn is dropping back and George doesn't waste any time pulling up on the long ball and knocking it down to take a one-point lead late in a close game. PG does this a lot, as now it's Wagner who's on his heels, allowing George another pull-up three. Here, PG comes off a Plumlee screen to receive the ball from Bones. And now again with Wagner, PG uses a quick crossover and a step back for the separation needed to make another triple. His isolation game works at all levels, as here he's able to control his body for a tough finish, and now Boston Reeves, it's the same step back move we saw before. Here against one of the league's best defenders in Anthony Davis, Paul George isn't afraid to attack him off the bounce, blowing on by and then finishing through contact for a foul and one. Now in another big moment, it's Russell who picks him up. PG will again make the read that Russell's retreating, which allows him the space necessary for another triple. Even with multiple defenders, PG can still make a play, first splitting the double team and then finishing through the contact for the deuce. This level of shot making in a pinch is going to be a huge plus for the Sixers next season but it's not that simple. To an extent, it almost feels like deja vu, as when the Sixers traded for James Harden, it felt like a clunky existence with Joel Embiid, as both players wanted to take more isolation looks, as the Sixers offense quickly turned into my turn, your turn ball. Although James Harden would soon start making plays with Embiid out of the pick and roll, it didn't matter, as whenever James Harden was scoring the ball for himself, it just didn't feel productive. Paul George can take these kind of isolation looks more often without Embiid on the floor, but when when Joel was in the game, George will need to keep his teammates involved, making quick decisions and keeping the ball moving. If PG and Embiid can coexist without any issues, that will make this Sixers team a true title contender. Don't, right. don't pick up your dribble because they're crowding that paint. Maxi, oh man, he changed hands midair. That he's given opportunities and he's going to make the most of them. Maxi from the logo, Tyrese Maxi. The third reason why the 76ers could be the best team in the East next season has to do with how they utilize Tyrese Maxey. Last season, the loss of Embiid allowed the breakout of Maxey, who averaged 25.9 points, 6.2 assists, and a steal on 45% shooting. Tyrese is an effective scorer from outside, which then sets up his inside scoring. Because the defense is aware of Maxi's speed with the ball, they often sag off of him, which allows him to get looks from the outside. But then when the defense does come up to meet him, he's going to leave you in the dust, which makes him a very tough guard. Even when you think you've played him perfectly, like Chris Dunn does here, it doesn't matter, as Maxi can also finish through contact. Here, Collins gets switched on to Maxi in transition and knows he's not going to be able to keep up with him, so he sags off allowing Maxi the triple. Here, Chris Dunn will make the closeout to Maxi, and this is what happens, as Tyrese loses him for two. Then again with Chris Dunn, he gets caught way too far out on Maxi as he takes advantage, but this time Maxi throws a curveball into the mix, as even though he's lost Dunn, he still steps back, completely losing him for an open three. What makes this even harder for opposing defenses is the fact that Maxi is a willing and capable three-point shooter, this time pulling one from Steph Curry range and knocks it down. Out on the break is where he can really be deadly, as here Kelly O'Linick looks around as if to say, help me, as Maxi beats him back for two. A lineup with just Maxi and George could be an intriguing one, as the speed of Maxi and the shot making of Paul George might give the Sixers a potential lineup that can actually outscore opponents when Embiid is off the floor. The fourth reason why the 76ers could be the best team in the East next season is because of the other additions they made. Along with signing Paul George, the 76ers also brought in Caleb Martin, Andre Drummond, Reggie Jackson, and the rookie Jared McCain, along with re-signing Kelly Oubre. This is undoubtedly the deepest team Embiid has ever had, 
as between the scoring ability of PG and Maxi, along with the defense and shooting of Ubre, Martin and Jackson, the 76ers have constructed the deepest team in basketball. With this, Embiid has decided it's time to sign the extension, which sees him remain a Sixer until 2029, along with an extra $193 million. This is the time to win a title, as Joel Embiid is not getting any younger. But to really understand just how these new additions are going to help the Sixers contend for that elusive NBA title, we need to take a deeper look into what each player brings to the table, using the crafted NBA stats. Starting off with Caleb Martin, who's a great 3 and D type player that would be a great fit either in the starting lineup or off the bench. On defense, Martin forces turnovers in the 97th percentile, protects drives to the paint in the 72nd percentile, and is a versatile defender, which is good enough to see Caleb Martin rank in the 79th percentile as an overall defensive player. With his most similar defensive player on the NBA being Nikhil Alexander-Walker, which is great company. On offense, Caleb is average at about everything, not being outstanding at any one thing, but just being solid across the board, giving him an overall offensive rating in the 47th percentile, being most similar to Dyson Daniels, now on the Atlanta Hawks. Then moving on to Andre Drummond, who had a resurgence in Chicago, as he managed to grab nine rebounds off the bench in limited minutes. On offense, he's the game's best offensive rebounder, ranking in the 100th percentile on offensive rebounding, while he also finds himself in the 95th percentile in free throw rate, with his offensive lookalike being Clint Capella. Then on defense, he has an impressive resume, as he's in the 90th percentile in deflections, 94th in forced turnovers, 85th in defensive rebounding, 67th in rim defense, and 88th in block percentage, which sees him rank in the 70th percentile as an overall defender. This score is low because of his 8th percentile ranking in defensive versatility, but when you consider the fact that he's just going to be backing up Embiid, he actually doesn't need to be versatile. He's most likely to like defender in basketball is Alperin Shangoon, which kind of tells us more about Shangoon than it does Drummond, as he's certainly a rising star in the NBA. Then with Reggie Jackson, he was able to provide a steady contribution for the Nuggets last season, after not even being in the rotation when they won the championship, putting up 10.2 points per game in only 22 minutes of court time. Jackson on offense can be quite streaky, but he is a good passer, as Crafted rates his passing ability an 84 out of 100, but his overall offensive rating is in the 30th percentile compared to Dennis Schroeder. On defense, his numbers aren't good, ranking in the 9th percentile as an overall defensive player. But where his value is noticed is his ability to handle the basketball and just run simple plays off the bench, acting as a team's floor general, which when Maxi or Lowry isn't in the game, will be handy. Now moving on to Kelly Oubre, he's proved his worth as after signing the minimum deal with the Sixers only a season ago, they re-signed him to a larger contract after he put up 15.4 points, 5 rebounds with 1.1 steals on 44% shooting. The three ball was the main offensive issue for Kelly last season as he only managed a 33% shooting percentage from beyond the arc, but his defense somewhat made up for that as his overall size and strength makes him an extremely versatile defender, ranking in the 89th percentile. However, something that knocks his overall defensive rate down, despite being great in the passing lanes and forcing turnovers, is his lack of ability to defend without fouling, as he's in the 30th percentile for that stat, which in turn dropped his defense all the way down to the 25th percentile. It's worth noting that his defense was better in the playoffs, and so was his three ball, which improved from 33% to 39%. However, if Caleb Martin can burst out of the gates, Ubre might find himself in a battle for minutes, which is a space that we need to watch coming into next season. Now taking these stats and information, we can now pit them against the reigning champion, Boston Celtics. Boston have a great defensive backcourt with Drew Holiday and Derek White, who would make life very hard for Tyrese Maxey, who might even be played out of the series. Paul George would have to deal with Jalen Brown, who's an elite defender in his own right, which is another good matchup for Boston. Embiid should be the one with the chance to make the impact on the series, but we've seen this story before, as despite how old our Horford is, he always seems to have his way with Joel. This time round though, Al Horford is two years older than their last playoff matchup back in 2023, and hopefully with some injury luck on Embiid's side, I'd expect a huge series from Joel. Embiid's size and strength advantage over Porzingis would force Boston to have to double team him nearly every possession, which would in turn open up threes for Oubre or Martin, which is a story the Celtics have had to deal with before in the battles against the Miami Heat. Then on defense, PG would likely go to Jalen Brown, while either 
Oubre or Martin would find themselves on Tatum due to the Sixers not wanting to risk George getting into foul trouble. As good as White and Holiday can be offensively, they don't require a defensive stopper as Maxi would likely just rest on White because of Holiday's strength. Embiid would then also have to hold up on defense as Chris Stapp's Porzingis can not only score from inside but the perimeter also. Ultimately, this 76ers team goes as far as Joel Embiid can take them as if he could be healthy for a postseason and play well in general, I could see the 76ers coming out on top. But that's just my take. What do you guys think? Are the Philadelphia 76ers the real deal? Or will the Joel Embiid Paul George pairing go down just like the James Harden one did? Let me know in the comments below.